thank you again for doing this. So oh, let me stop happy. my video here. So uh, Kevin, the very first question I have for you is, how were you inspired by Star Trek? Okay, before I start, um, inspired currently or how has my life or, I mean, just a little, I mean, I just make sure that I'm answering the question the way you want it. Um, like what inspires me now? What inspired me then? Yeah, let, let's go. We're, we're going to sort of go over your life. So let's oh. start. Yeah, we'll start at the beginning. Terrific. When the dinosaurs, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I was born in the house my father built. No, that's Nixon's life. That's not mine. Um, the, let me, let me collect myself for a second. Um, my first inspirations that I know were generated from Star Trek was creative storytelling. Uh, the idea that I would take my Mego action figures outside and come up with my own adventures. The, um, my neighbor next door, who was a year older than me, my neighbor across the street, who was two years older than me, the three of us would play Star Trek. We would set his, uh, um, the light um, right outside the kitchen door that went outside was a single round fixture that was one of, th of three lights on the same panel. So it was our transporter and his bathroom was our shuttlecraft. And we played outside with uh, the Star Trek tracer guns as our phasers. We were a landing party that explored the creek that ran behind my house and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, the imaginations that brought those stories to life for me, even, you know, just on the surface of the storytelling, not getting into the uh, um, ethical and moral dilemmas that would make me think and maybe guide my life later, just the, the pure imagination of um, each week them going to a different place and, and meeting different aliens who all spoke the same language, but you know, we won't get into that part. Um, that's, that's the inspiration for me was uh, strong characters, um, imaginative situations, uh, great relationships between the characters that made me want to be a part of that universe and or tell stories of that universe so much so that I pretended to live in it with my friends. Absolutely love that answer. Oh, uh, well, so then how did you end up writing for the Star Trek communicator, which I completely miss? Oh, I do too. Uh, my first uh, stab at the communicator, let me, okay, let me rephrase. When I was starting my freelance writing career, um, just giving me something to do outside the newspaper, I followed the advice that you pitch to periodicals only after you've read them for a year or more. Uh, so you can get a voice for, uh, an idea of the voice of the magazine, that kind of a thing. And so I had one magazine, well, two, well, three, <laughs> um, between Famous Monsters, Starlog, and Star Trek Communicator, I immersed myself in uh, all things sci-fi pop culture, monster movies, uh, loved those magazines, uh, still have uh, great fondness for them now. Um, I decided I was going to pitch an idea to Star Trek Communicator. The idea was that my former fiction writing teacher, James Gunn at the University of Kansas, had written a Star Trek novel based on a Theodore Sturgeon script treatment that never was produced called The Joy Machine. And I thought, this is great. I can drive over to Lawrence, interview Professor Gunn, um, get this really cool story for Communicator, especially because this is uh, not the typical novel. Uh, I also attended college with John Ordover, who at the time was the editor of uh, the Star Trek line of pocket books, and I'm sure that's how he connected with Professor Gunn as well. So I was very eager to pitch this story. I wrote up a nice proposal. Uh, at that point in history, we were faxing our communications, so I faxed it over to them. 
uh, at the offices in Denver. And it was a few, within a few days, I think, uh, I got a fax back. And back in the day, uh, we would laugh about the one sheet of paper that had either been photocopied so many times that, you know, the serifs would start to round on the print and, and little flecks of dust would now be magnified into black dots because it had been photocopied and reused over and over. And I got a fax back of this form letter that looked like it had been around forever, which was basically, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, we'll, we, we get story ideas all the time, and we didn't, you know, so, you know, thanks, but no thanks kind of a thing. And I thought, well, crap. Um, it wasn't too long after that that uh, uh, Chase Masterson, um, who played Lita on Deep Space Nine, was in Kansas City for two conventions within the span of like a month and a half. I'd never met her, I knew very little about her, and I thought maybe she has a Kansas City connection and this is why she's, she's uh, coming back to my neck of the woods. Um, so I spoke with her briefly at the first convention and, said, and told her, I know you're coming back for this other one. Do you, you, know, do you have any connections? She said, nope, I was just invited. I said, would you have time during your uh, uh, visit to the convention? that I could interview you for about your experiences on Deep Space Nine. She said, absolutely. I didn't tell her that I was writing this on spec. Um, she never really questioned it. It was the first time she'd ever even been interviewed for uh, anything regarding Deep Space Nine. So I did what you're not supposed to do. I interviewed her. I wrote the story. I faxed it to Star Trek Communicator and said, I have this piece that's available. Um, if you are interested, I would love to talk to you about getting it placed. If you're not, I understand. And if I don't hear from you in a week or so, I, I think I said, if I don't hear from you in seven days or something, um, I will, uh, shop it elsewhere. You know, I mean, spoiler alert, kids, this is not how you get a gig at a magazine. Uh, but that's what I did. Uh, the phone rang within an hour. And it was Dan Madsen, the, the publisher and creator of Star Trek Communicator, who said, I love it, I want it, and what else do you have? And that started what has been a, uh, you know, decades of friendship between me and Dan. Uh, we still stay in touch. Uh, he and Larry Nemechek both gave me wonderful opportunities in the uh, Communicator. And that's how I started my professional career in Star Trek. I absolutely love how you, well, <laughs> you, you did it the uh, improper way. But I did it the uh, improper way. I, you know what? I did fiction the improper way, too. I don't, I mean, everyone says, how did you break in? And I say, I broke in in a way that you never should try. But I tried, I mean, it was, I guess it's very Kobayashi Maru now that I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it but <laughs> it had the virtue of having never been tried. <laughs> My, my first um, interview I did was uh, for the newspaper here was for Dan Brown for Da Vinci Code. Really? Wow, yeah. cool. And um, same thing. I got permission to do it. And then I thought, well, maybe I should ask him if he'd be willing to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully he said yes. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what. I've, I mean, I read the Da Vinci Code um, early in its, in its life and have not read other works of his, but when that hit and just went nuts, all I could think of was, what kind of pressure does a writer have to think, now I gotta top that? <laughs> because it was an event. I mean, there was just, I mean, there, I probably count on one hand in my lifetime, the, the, the books that, that seized you know, the country's attention like Da Vinci Code did. I'm, I I hope he was a fun interview. He seems like a nice guy. He, he it was a great interview and it launched my career too. So oh, very thankful for that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, um, how did you end up writing with Dayton Ward? Well, uh, Dayton and I. Well, okay. Let me let me try to. I'm trying to give you an easy cut in. My partnership with Dayton Ward started when I met him as a source for a magazine story I did for Star Trek Communicator. 
uh, Strange New Worlds was uh, unique in a, uh, as far as a publishing effort of pocketbooks because it was a contest inviting amateur submissions for a licensed property. And licensed properties generally, you know, want a little bit, uh, they want to make, they want to put their uh, um, uh, intellectual property in the hands of people that they regard as professionals. But uh, uh, Pocketbooks went ahead with this uh, with the blessings of, uh, of Paramount at the time or Viacom, I forget which, um, and did a contest. I believe the first contest drew, I want to say around 3,500 uh, short story entries with just the theme of write us a Star Trek story. And they picked 17 of the, they had a first, second, and third but there were 17 stories in that batch of submissions that were selected for a, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the anthology, the printed anthology, Strange New Worlds. Um, this was back in the day before at least I had email. So I would uh, get information from the, from pocketbooks that would give you the names of the winners, the um, uh, phone numbers so I could contact the winners and interview them over the phone. Once they were contacted by pocket, it was fair game for me to call. So I discovered that the list had somebody who lived, you know, just 20 or 30 miles from me. And I thought it'd be much more fun to interview you know, this writer in person than it would be for, uh, um, uh, you know, just to do it over the phone. So I called him. He agreed and Dayton and I met at a uh, restaurant bar in suburban Kansas City and talked about his writing for Strange New Worlds and in the course of our conversation we you know um, decided that uh, we should hang out um, you know go do the things that our wives did not want to do with us um, which um, probably sounds a lot, <laughs> I probably should rephrase that. That sounds awful. Um, we decided that we should hang out and go to conventions and comic book stores and the kinds of things that uh, our wives uh, would rather use their time differently. Um, we went to a couple, we went to Star Trek conventions together, of course, over, over the course of that time, Dayton had, uh, um, uh, Ent entered and won a spot in the second and third volume of Strange New Worlds, which then disqualified him because it was only open to people who, were had, who had had two or fewer professional sales. And that third one was uh, the one that got him in and disqualified him. It also earned him a spot to uh, write his first Star Trek novel, uh, In the Name of Honor, uh, that uh, uh, Pocket Books published. And so that's that was Dayton's path. My path was that I uh, had been invited by John Ordover to break the news that uh, Pocketbooks and Microsoft were entering into a uh, agreement to uh, produce fiction solely for uh, electronic consumption. Um, the Microsoft ebook reader, which was uh, literally ahead of its time, uh, was being introduced and they wanted original content that would encourage people to um, want to use this, um, this reader. And so one of the things they did was uh, they uh, uh, launched uh, Starfleet Corps of Engineers. Um, which was a uh, um, ebook original for Pocket, and uh, they had the first three stories um, ready to, for uh, um, release, and wanted me to break this news on Star Trek.com and the Communicator. So, in the course of interviewing John, and he was telling me the premise of Starfleet Corps of Engineers, which is fairly self-explanatory. These are the you know the 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 text without getting too technical in the writing that you know the people who go in and and uh, solve problems and and uh, you know uh, fix things you know all things engineering basically and John said well we're doing stories like this or we're doing stories like that and we're doing stuff like this and I said so you could you, so you might be looking for stories like um, the 24th century crew figures out how to rescue the defiant from the 23rd century fallen into, you know, interface space. 
And there's this pause on the line. He said, yeah, that's exactly the kind of story that we're looking for. And I said, may I pitch it? And he said, sure. Um, and I hadn't written fiction since college. I hadn't written anything uh, to even submit to a publication. I mean, I took three semesters of fiction writing in college and, uh, and that was it. So I called up Dayton and said, uh, I think I just got myself into a real problem and uh, explained to him what was happening and asked him if he wanted to write this story together. Um, and uh, he said, absolutely. Uh, we wrote the pitch to John. Uh, John doubled our length. He basically made it a two-parter. He said, I think the story is good, strong enough that, uh, we, uh, that it needs more uh, breathing room. And that was the first time we worked together. And based on that, um, he invited us to write kind of a uh, pseudo origin story for Starfleet Corps of Engineers, or at least kind of, a, you know, background for the series. Uh, that became a three-parter that then was published as a novel called Foundations. And from that, he gave us the opportunity to write two books in his nine book arc that it was the Time To series. And so we were off to the races. Well, um, let me ask about Starfleet Corps of Engineers for a second, because they essentially started off as ebooks before right. you know, they, they eventually did get published. So was, uh, were they, the fact that they were ebooks before ebooks really became mainstream, was that an experiment that uh, was too soon or? I, I think that Microsoft was definitely eager to, explore you know electronic publishing uh they went with star trek because they recognized that star trek fans by and large are early adopters of technology they're open to the ideas um of the future as it were um our uh, um the first ebook that dayton and i wrote which was interface part one was bundled with the palm pilot and I've got it in a file. I would have to look. Dayton might be able to, to recall this. But the very first time there was a best selling ebook list, and it wasn't compiled by you know, New York Times or anybody, I forget who was doing it, but they were doing top 10 ebooks. Um, Interface part two, they got the first one for free, so they had to go out and spend five bucks or whatever it was to get the second part to finish the story, was I think the number six or seven bestseller for the year, the first full year that it was out. And, um, and I think that uh, like we outsold Clive Cussler or something. I mean, there was like a couple of authors that uh, uh, I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, but it was, you know, I mean, you ever tried to read anything on a Palm Pilot? I mean, it's, it is not the same experience you get on a Nook. So the, I think that there was just uh, um, uh, technological or hardware barriers to people really uh, getting into uh, reading eBooks. And Starfleet Corps of Engineers as an eBook series was ended by the publisher, I think, within a year of things really taking off electronically. So that was a shame that it, it did what it did. Yeah. Another example of things I wish that would have continued like Star Trek communicator, the Corps of engineers. Um, and, yeah. well, and communicator, to, I mean, to, uh, um, to be truthful, um, that was just, it was just one, I mean, it was a, I love that publication. And I love the work that we did but it was almost this connective tissue technology in the sense of it was the days, you know, it was in the days before the internet. And it was in this period where Star Trek was, uh, was, was pretty quiet. I mean, there's, I don't know. I think enterprise might've been the only show in the, in production at the time. I'm trying to remember if enterprise had gone out of production before um, uh, the communicator ended. I'm trying to remember. It's, uh, you know, my brain is old and feeble, but the, uh, I mean, it was, it really was kind of, you know, the, I mean, communicator and the books um, were like these two things that were the tethers that Star Trek fans hung on to when news and anything of interest was few and far between. I mean, we were doing 
we, you know, the, I mean, not all the time, but we were doing a lot of stories about just what Star Trek actors were doing now um, because, you know, there were fans that wanted to follow them. So, um, and then when uh, the 2009 theatrical went into production, um, things were just really, you know, kicked up for Star Trek. And now, you know, in 2020 with multiple shows in production and, um, you know, the, the book line thriving and, and just all sorts of uh, stuff that's happening for Star Trek, it just feels like a renaissance. I never had this, you know, even when we were just getting a couple of movies or, or getting a movie every two or three years, uh, just we never had any sense of, uh, of you know, uh, content the way that we have now. Uh, that, that, that's a good point. Um, and you're, you're right. I, I feel like we're in the middle of Renaissance too, even though I don't see us having a new film anytime soon. But uh, I don't see us having a new film anytime soon, but, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sharing an opinion of one, um, Star Trek, I think thrives on television. Uh, I love the idea of a theatrical, but, um, I, I, I would much rather have an hour on TV every week than a, uh, than two hours every three or four years myself. Movies are exciting and, and, and some of them have really great stories. Some of them don't. And I would much rather, you know, have a, uh, um, you know, well, this one didn't quite work for me, but there's always next week <laughs> instead of, well, this one didn't quite work for me. But there's always 2024. <laughs> um, you know, the uh, idea of Star Trek, uh, you know, was designed for television. I feel like that it thrives there. And given that, you know, we have coming seasons of Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which now has a, um, a new mission under the same title with uh, Captain Pike and Star Trek Lower Decks uh, and the possibility of a uh, Section 31 series. And there's a second animated series that is uh, um, in... I don't know what stage of production, but it was announced at uh, um, Comic Con and things. And who knows what? I mean, you know, the, the you know, it's just up to the imagination of the writers and the support of the fans. You know, they, they wouldn't be doing this content if people weren't watching it and people weren't eager to support it with uh, with their money. So, yeah, I I feel like Star Trek's doing exactly what it should be doing, which is uh, diversifying its content on television. You're preaching to the choir, just for the record. <laughs> and I 100% agree with you. Yeah, it, it, it's a TV show. That's where it got its start. And being able to sit with my family and watch, you know, the new episode as it premieres is just, I miss that. And it's nice to have that back now. Yep. Only we can keep that going. We'll hope. We'll yep. hope. Um, so back to writing. Um you did uh, Road Edo solo. I did. Uh, talk to me about that and why Eric, so, for goodness sakes. Oh my gosh. Well, um, the, uh, the uh, animated Star Trek series was my entry point to Star Trek. Um, I wasn't even aware of it being a live action TV show until my across the street neighbor told me about it. So I was, uh, uh, I mean, 19... 70, September of 73, I was, you know, three months into being nine and um and uh, you know filmation and i watched it just because the um you know saturday morning preview um you know uh, special made it look cool and i loved it i mean i i loved everything about it and then uh, you know my my neighbor was like well you know it's a real live tv show well um, and so then we started watching it together after school because that's when it would run and i had no idea so um uh, Erex and Mress were two characters in Star Trek that I thought were terrific. Um, I understood, I did have a concept that they were uh, merely animated. But uh, the idea of, you know, aliens on the bridge that were beyond just Spock, you know, I mean, just, you know, beyond the pointed ears, I thought was really cool. Um, there was an opportunity when the series was pitched um the i'm sorry the anthology the um that uh, that story was in the um uh, new frontier anthology and 
we were allowed to use any character that was associated with the crew of the Excalibur that Peter David was writing, as long as the story took place at a point in time before Peter took charge of those characters. So that way we wouldn't, uh, you know, I mean, write something in a short story that would hamstring an idea that he might potentially have farther in the series. And I totally respected that. Uh, so the opportunity to write um, uh, in, in, you know, a story that kind of, uh, you know, tugged on the strings of my love for the animated series was a terrific uh, idea. So yeah, I so I went for it, and the other, and it also gave us a chance to play with the idea of um, the, you know there was we were kind of getting two different sets of information um, you know is uh, um, you know is is Eric Adosian is he Triaxian uh, you know uh, there was. Uh, uh, discrepancies on how he was, uh, you know, and what is his origin story, um, you know, that informs the character the way Peter's interpreting it, as opposed to some of the information that um, that came out of uh, Lincoln Enterprises, um, that uh, you know, I mean, just that or the um, Bible for the uh, animated series and things like that. So. Um, so that was pretty cool to get a chance to kind of, I mean, and that was the whole hook of the story was that uh, uh, this um, Starfleet officer's, you know, prime responsibility was to uh, uh, get Eric's who had been recovered in a time travel or a time displacement accident um, back to his home planet in, uh, in time to uh, see, you know, in time to be present for the end of his father's life. And, um, and so, and it was actually, it was a note from Peter that that story was going to have a, uh, um, a fairly somber turn in my original pitch. Um, uh, Eric's didn't make it back. Um, and I'm going to spoil the story for any of you who haven't read it. And I apologize. It's, you know, it's, it, I don't think it'll uh, um, be uh, enough to send you into therapy, but the uh, um, note that I got back from Peter was, well, what if, you know, because this guy has misunderstandings about Eric and his culture and his species and all this stuff throughout the story. What if there's this big rush to get back for uh, this event? And it turns out that it's not really an event at all. And we kind of worked out that, uh, um, that his species um, molds after X number of years. And, you know, so there is, so they treat this like a death and, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the skin cracks open and out comes the, you know, the, 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 the wrinkly wet hand of the, of, of, you know, his dad, but he's just getting a new skin basically. <laughs> and, uh, so, I mean, yes, it was important for him to see that, um, ceremony and he regretted missing it but the uh, loss wasn't uh, nearly the loss that uh, you know we were associating it with because we we're thinking about things in human terms which gave it a, a much lighter touch and uh, it was it was a great idea for you know and made it what i think is a lot better story and it is a cool story thanks um, i was this... feeling, uh, i mean the other um you know the the you know um uh, CD, uh, you know, uh, director's commentary. I was the whole time I was writing it. I was channeling Hugh Grant for the Starfleet officer, right down to trying to capture his uh, um, vocal ticks and pauses and things in his dialogue. So I don't know if that ever came across. Maybe we'll read it again and try to picture Hugh Grant in that role and see if it worked. I'm gonna have to go back and look. That's pretty cool. Um, a lot of the work you've done with Dayton is part of a grander series and vision. Um, I think Vanguard, for example. Oh. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you work collaboratively with Dayton, but then also with all the other authors on these uh, series? Well, you know, I mean, I like to think that, uh, I mean, I... In, I love collaborating with people. That's I'll, I'll, I'm very much a proponent of all of us is smarter than one of us. Um, I think that I mean I um, had and still have a mentor in my job at Hallmark Cards uh, named uh, Trish Barong, who is very active in improvisational theater here in Kansas City, very well regarded 
um, member of that community. And she taught me and other writers um, this spirit of yes and collaboration. Um, where if somebody pitches out an idea, you don't try to step on it with your own idea. You figure out, you know, I mean, we should have this. Yes. And we should then do this or, you know, you just, and then all of a sudden you're, you're building on these wonderful ideas. And, and I've been, you know, very blessed to have uh, met and worked with, uh, you know, a number of talented, fun authors who love the show like I do. And so whether it was, you know, Dana and I doing our, uh, our, you know, our individual works or when we would collaborate on uh, long form storytelling with David Mack and Marco Palmieri for Vanguard, when we worked on our uh, series of uh, called uh, Mere Anarchy that was original uh, ebook that was six stories of one planet's recovery from an ecological disaster, planetary ecological disaster over the course of several decades, um, told at diff, you know, from at different times in Kirk and the Enterprise's timeline. Um, Starfleet Corps of Engineers was uh, was collaborative effort. I mean, and really, I think one of the things that's happened with pocketbooks along the way, um, and I mean, I can speak to it from Dayton's and my entries in, and I'm. I, I think other people feel the same. Uh, there's very much a respect for what has gone before. There isn't somebody who's going to write a book um, heedless of everything that happened in the book that came out before it uh, and just, you know, well, I'm gonna ignore all that because that doesn't work for my story. I'm gonna do this. And because we have that sense of uh, yes and, co you know, cooperation and, uh, um, and the way we, we build our storytelling together. I think that that's benefited the line as a whole for years and years because it makes the reader feel like we're respecting their time um, and, and, and money and effort in, you know, in keeping all this straight and, and, and reading these stories if we don't care enough about that, then why would the reader care? And we've always taken that approach is, uh, you know, creating the stuff that we would love to enjoy. I absolutely love that answer. And well, the, the love shows, it really does. Cause well, yeah, we, we have clearly a, like it. We have a good time. Um, I have to ask you about the Legacies trilogy. Uh, the first book was by Greg Cox. The second uh -huh. was by David. And then you guys got to conclude it. Yep. How did another, that come about? Another uh, form of collaboration. Um, it, it was such. It was so so much fun. And you know, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Trek, it was kind of cool. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the way the way it timed out, uh, Dayton's and my book came out in September of. 2016. So we were the book that was the 50th anniversary book, which was, I mean, you know, we didn't expect ever to get handed a uh, opportunity like that, but it was a lot of fun to do. That's so cool. Um, you mentioned Hallmark. Um, what do you do at Hallmark? You're a senior writer. What does that mean? Um, senior writer pretty much is uh, putting words to anything that Hallmark does. Um, you know, so I will write greeting cards across multiple categories, uh, the majority of which I tend to write are with uh, licensed properties. So I work with uh, uh, DC Heroes, Marvel Heroes, Star Wars, Harry Potter, uh, Lego, um, Hello Kitty, <laughs> um, and, and Star Trek. Uh, and Star Trek more so with our keepsake ornaments than, uh, than with greetings. But uh, uh, anything that, uh, that writing exists on at Hallmark came from uh, our staff of writers. And that's, you know, so it's, it's definitely a full-time gig. You know, we have a, uh, a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of cards on those racks we got to get written. Um, but yeah, I've done, I've done a lot of fun things with uh, Star Trek and, and keepsake ornaments. Everything from helping suggest ideas for ornaments that uh, show up in the stores all the way to uh, writing the scripts for the sound portions of, uh, of those ornaments. Um, you know, the, probably the, the most sweeping Star Trek project I've ever done for Hallmark will be in stores in uh, July. 
of this year. Um, you know, we will have um, seven ornaments and a tree top, a tree topper um, over the course of three years. And when you assemble them all and press the uh, remote control, then you will have a uh, almost a 10, well, I think it's 11, an 11 minute performance of Mirror Mirror, which was a lot of fun to uh, take that script and try to distill it into a 10 minute narrative that still made sense and still kept some of the iconic dialogue and, uh, and scenes that we remember from that episode. So it was very, it was, it was a lot of fun to do. So you have, but that means then you have to collect all the various ornaments in order for that to work, but each individual well, ornament has its own part of that story, right? The, yes. But the way that we, wrote it the way the way that i wrote it the way that we envisioned it was no matter what combination of ornaments you have you will get something uh and it's not just random lines but an actual little story so year one is you know going to be the um the ncc 1701 uh on top of the tree with uh captain kirk and lieutenant uhura um you know, in July, and they have, you know, their uh, um, banter and, and things, you know, when they have exchanges in the episode. Um, then uh, in October, um, uh, Security Chief Sulu comes on the tree. And so those four will take part in the story. And then in 2021, two more ornaments will come in, I believe one in July and one in October. And then uh, in 2022, we'll have the sixth ornament in July and the seventh ornament in October. And I had to figure out on a spreadsheet the permutations of how the story would make sense for every combination of two, three, four, five, six, and seven that is possible from a group of eight. Took a little bit of time. A couple minutes. <laughs> um, but it works great. So I'm, uh, I'm very eager to see. I'm eager to have this in people's hands. I think they're going to love it. I can't wait to have it. It's really is once it started to, once we started to really lock down and I had to, I will, I will say this. I pushed for mirror mirror and I pushed to make sure that each of the seven, um, you know, leads, you know, the, the, the I mean, the, the, the seven that we that we think of, Kirk Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Sulu, Chekhov, and Uhura, um, you know, were all represented as uh, um, as separate ornaments, um, not some sort of well. I mean, they originally they said, "Do you think we can get away with just five? And I was like, "Well, who are you going to cut?" And they said, "Well, we're thinking uh, Scotty and Chekhov." And I said, "No way." <laughs> I said, you know, how do, how do you, I mean, Scotty's the person that, that gets them back. I mean, how, what, so we're just going to like pretend that didn't happen. Um, you know, so yeah, I, uh, I struggled and struggled. So uh, yeah, please, uh, um, uh, you know, show me I was right. Show them I was right. Buy all these ornaments. <laughs> well, that leads to my next question, which is um, in three years, are you going to have a special set of the entire thing that you can get in one lump uh i do set. not know that i know that um they will continue to f to sell the previous ornaments so if you came in to a store in 2022 and had never heard of this and was eager to find out or, and eager to see them you could buy if it's in the store i mean and it definitely will be online you could buy everything but um, but I don't know that they're going to repackage it to put it all in one box and get them all. I know that when we did uh, a series for Star Wars um, that I also wrote, Star Wars Storytellers, um, that uh, it was all ships and it was uh, about 10 minutes from the first film, um, the episode four, but chronologically, you know, first in our hearts, fourth on our screens. Um, the... Uh, and you know, so people would be able to piece that together, um, and that didn't coordinate with the tree toppers. So uh, we're, you know, Star Trek's got a leg up on those guys. 
That's so cool. Um, oh, you'll, and, yeah, I think you're going to dig it. Oh, I, I will for sure. Um, and just for the record, I'm a snow globe collector. You guys uh-huh. need to come out more snow globes. Do a Star Trek snow globe, please. I was throwing that at you. I will pass that along. In fact, I just wrote copy um, for some uh, Star Trek proposals uh, that would be in stores in 21 and 22. And according to um, our, uh, you know, the people who keep track of all this stuff on what, what sells well at Hallmark store, Snow Globes is on the list. So I will, I'm not quite sure what, what's, I mean, help me out with the scene. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, do we have a snow globe of Spock getting hit in the chest with the spore flower? I mean, that kind of looks like snow. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it would be. Maybe just, I've seen people do glitter. I mean, are they in, are they on the transporter pad and you shake it up and the glitter flies around? I mean, that's the only thing that I am trying to figure out now, or is it Kirk standing underneath the storage compartments? and the glitter are tribbles and you shake it up and they all fly around. You know, these, these, you know, this is why I get paid to do what I do. Well, I was going to say just even the enterprise and maybe even having it play the theme would be fine, but. <laughs> what, but what do you put in the, in the globe, Jeff? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, when you shake it up, what do you want to see flying around? Um, well, yeah, I guess you could do uh, like something that looks like stars, perhaps. Okay, sure. That's I mean, that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it would probably be glitter. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, ah, and, I'll, oh, and I'll show you a couple uh, of the hallmark ornaments or the uh, snow globes I have here. Um, let's talk about conventions. Um, sure. I know you go to the conventions not only as an author but also to promote the hallmark uh, yes. brand. Yes. How do you see them changing as a result of what we're currently dealing with? Ooh. Um, I, well, here, let me, let me, let me rephrase. Conventions in the future are going to take a different tone. And I don't necessarily mean a, uh, a, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to suggest anything, you know, uh, fearful or somber, but people are going to be more conscious of, um, you know, their interactivity at that just as they would be for uh, uh, any place else. I think that, and, you know, I am no physician. Uh, I think that people are going to become more comfortable and just more personally responsible for their health and well-being and that of other attendees. Um, I know that at least in particular with the coronavirus, uh, if we uh, you know wear our masks, um, you know keep our distance, uh, wash our hands, uh, re- refrain from touching our faces, that you know those four strategies are going to take care of a you know the the great majority of um, issues when it comes to uh, contagion. Um, I do think that some conventions that are, are, you know, I mean, when we're looking at the finances, um, are going to look at opportunities to extend into the digital or even the virtual space uh, for attendees, especially people who want to uh, uh, just, you know, have the the joy of, you know, the the panels and and the way I look at it is. I think there's just some real opportunities if people want to explore them. It may, you know, it won't, it won't capture the precise convention um, look and feel, and it won't be for everybody, but there are going to be plenty of people who would really enjoy having, you know, a passcode that they paid money for to see a uh, panel discussion. Um, I would argue that at some of the bigger shows like uh, San Diego or uh, New York, that there might be, you know, a fraction of the people who would want to see a panel discussion who actually get in. I mean, you know, I, mean I remember back when you know, some of these really exclusive panels started that they would screen a trailer or a clip from a movie, you know, for the 4,000 people that were able to get into their massive meeting room understanding fully that 130,000 people who didn't get in and you know and that's just on site 
want to see this this trailer. So what goes on the internet first is somebody's shaky smartphone and crowds roaring and screaming and studios were discovering that the first impression that fans were getting of content that they were excited about and wanted to make money from looked like this. And so now when they have these, uh, um, you know, uh, big debut, um, you know, trailer parties or whatever you want to call them at, at comic conventions, they're just standing with their finger on the button to upload it to YouTube. As soon as that panel's over, it's boom, and then everyone gets to see it. Or if they even debut it at the beginning and, you know, I mean, so they've made accommodations. Um, I think that there will never, I mean, you know, seeing somebody live on stage is, is always going to feel better than, you know, watching a streamable, um, you know, content. But I do think it's going to be inclusive. I think there are going to be people who have, uh, uh, you know, financial hardships for traveling to shows. Uh, they have uh, um, physical or and health hardships for being at shows. Um, they've got uh, so many places that they're being denied the chance to be part of, you know, this segment of fandom and the uh, um, digital and virtual opportunities could be game changers for them. I'm, you know, I'm never in a club that's so big that somebody else can't be in it. I really like the opportunity that uh, that digital and virtual fandom could present to people that might otherwise not get to enjoy what I get to enjoy. So I'm, I'm all in. Um, in fact, I just got contacted a few days ago um, by organizers of a convention that I was planning to attend that uh, got canceled. And they were plumbing the interests of the guests at that convention for basically um, you know, making some uh, digital content available on the weekend the convention would have happened, but isn't. And I you know, answered immediately, just I'm in, send me the details when you have them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to include people in this. I, I, that's great, and I'm glad to hear that. Um, I do a thing called Thriller Fest every year in New York City. It's, yeah, uh, where the International Thriller Writers get together. Yeah, and uh, we're we're doing a virtual one this year, and oh, as a result, because of that, we're having all these authors who never would come, like uh -huh. Dan Brown. Uh, yeah, we have Ken Follett, and we have oh, all these wow. people from all over the world doing this because they can do it from their living room. Yeah, and how fun is that? Oh, it's been a blast to work on that for sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious now, what is your favorite Star Trek series? Ah. And, and what is your favorite episode of that series? Ooh, tough. Um, okay, but before, before I do this, I just want to caution you. Um, I've, got a, I've got a hard stop at 4.15, which is 2.15 your time. Is that okay? Yeah, we're almost done. So it's perfect. Oh, perfect. I just didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to skip anything that you really wanted to hit. Um, no, we're actually good. I wanted to try and keep it under an hour. So terrific. Okay, you're great. Good. As long as you're cool, I'm cool. Um, the, uh, I feel like the Star Trek's a lot like many things. You never forget your first. Um, I am I'm always going to defer to the original series as my favorite. That's the one that if I just want to watch Star Trek for fun and not for work that I will put in. Um, there are a number of go-to episodes. The one that I'm sure I have committed to memory, uh, the one that I never get tired of watching on the original series is The Doomsday Machine. I think that uh, William Wyndham as uh, Commodore Decker is my favorite guest star uh, performance in Star Trek, maybe period. Um, I really, I, I, I mean, I really like uh, Rain Wilson's Harry Mudd as well. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, everyone who is, uh, you know, who's in that episode has something to do 
Um, there's great exchanges between the characters. Um, the, you know, the, the, the score is terrific. Uh, the, there's true tension. I remember the first time I saw it, I really thought that, uh, um, that Scotty would not be able to get Kirk back. Um, and uh, just start to finish. Uh, Doomsday Machine is a real, still remains a real treat for me. And uh, so that, that would be mine. I suggest you beam me aboard. <laughs> Some of my, <laughs> one of my favorite moments, and you really can't hear it much. But um, when uh, when things are effing up, and Scotty just crawled out of the Jeffries tube, and they screw up again, and you can hear him cuss under his breath to jump right back on in, and I thought this is so great. <laughs> I am, oh, it's so awesome. Um, why do you think Star Trek has endured? I believe the endurance of Star Trek really cooks down to the simple concept that these are people who are the best at what they do doing it together. Um, I, I feel like that, uh, that we have seen television and movie narratives evolve over time, mature. Um, we look at movies that are 10, 15, 30, 50 years old now and see ways we do it differently. The advantage that the original series had was quiet character moments uh, over the course of 79 hours of content. And the, and I think these characters, what they represent themselves individually, um, what they represent as, uh, as professionals and the, what they rep what they mean to each other. And the, uh, I, that's what I think is the core of what drives Star Trek's endurance. Um, you know, there's lots of things that make it popular. Um, you know, whether it's special effects or the performances or the social commentary and the way we can quote it and draw parallels to our lives then and now. But why do successive generations pick it up? Uh, I, I really think that it has to do with uh, these are we, I mean, we are seeing aspirational representations of people and humans who can, uh, you know, who can achieve and be hurt and bond and that's, you know, I mean, and relate. I mean, their, their experiences still translate to our uh, experiences. Um, you know, the tagline that got a little bit of mocking when it came out for Star Trek The Motion Picture was that the human adventure is just beginning and Star Trek is truly a human adventure. Um, it, you know, whether it takes place in space, um, you know, underground or, or you know, whatever. Um, these, it, it just is uh, exploring the uh, positive and negative, but mostly positive facets of humanity that every generation can relate to and be entertained by. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you. Um, can you do, can you do space, the final frontier, that whole ah, speech from memory? Yes. Sure. I can. Am I, am I staring in the screen? Are you going to edit these together or something? Yes. Okay. So we're going to put different people saying each word of it. Yep. So yes, yep. That's perfect. So I will, I'll, I'll, I will, I'll try not to slur the words, or I'll try to give some space in between, so uh, you can make your cuts easier. Thank you. Sure. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. That was fantastic. Last thing, can you give yes. me a live long and prosper? Ah, you need, the, you need the sign? Yep. 
Okay. I mean, am I am I saying it or am I just flashing it? Uh, you can do both if you don't mind. I, I I'm happy to do both. Live long and prosper. That is fantastic. Thank Does you. you uh, did perfect. Let me.